Brian. How are you doing? Pretty good. That's good. Um, I guess the first question that I have for you is where you were born or when did you arrive to be humbled? I was born in Orange County, California. Um, basically raised and schooled in Southern California, Santa Ana for the most part. Dad was a school teacher, then a principal within the Santa Ana School District, 30 some odd years. Um, I left, <clears throat> I've been in, out of, in and out of Arizona since that time for almost 50 years, uh, doing different projects, starting up different uh, activities, different offices for different companies. Then moving here full time, uh, it would have been 1993, 1994, uh, basically to get married. Uh, met my wife here and um, decided to stay. So you met her here in Be Humble? Met her actually in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona on a blind date. Wow, those are one of the few that work out right. <laughs> <My dates. laughs> yep. And um, so, how did you move to it actually doing humble itself? Um, <clears throat> we lived in Apache Junction for about 15 years, and then we moved from there up to here. We just got tired of the heat, more or less looking at a semi retirement, changing all the way around. and. We explored the areas. We, initially, we were looking at Chino Valley, which is to the north of Dewey Humboldt. Um, and then just by chance, the very last minute before we make a decision, we found the place that we moved into here. Two and a half acres, got a well, nice house, view, everything that we wanted. So. And so where, when did you, when was the date that you actually moved here? What was the year? 2011. 2011. And then, so do, is this area impacted by the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site? Where we are resi mm -hmm. residing in, no, there is no impact. The mine itself and the uh, smelter really have a limited impact. It's mainly just to the actual town of Humboldt before they combined, and usually not much more than a thousand feet at maximum from the main industrial areas. When did you first learn about the contaminated asso contamination associated with the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site? Uh, that would have been 2008. Uh, during the initial process of it going through the Superfund setup, I was working for a consulting company in uh, the Phoenix area at the time, in which we were actually bidding on trying to do some of the Superfund work. And so what did you hear about it at that time? It was completely unknown. Um, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality was on a tear to discover and go after any kind of smelting within the state of Arizona as a major contaminant within the state. And they were also on a tear to try to discredit any kind of mining going on at that particular moment in time. Uh, the EPA got involved in the Superfund or the what became the Superfund area at the invite of the City Council of Dewey Humboldt at that time. And what was that era or what were the years during that? Um, the initial work by the state of Arizona was about 2002. Um, EPA got invited, I believe it was 2007-2008. They really didn't start doing much of anything until about 2010, um, mainly because of funding and the whole process of getting declared super fund and everything else to go with that. And during that time, you didn't live here? Right? No, but came through the area quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the memories at that time? Uh, do you remember hearing about what the community members were doing or maybe the local government was doing? when it came to the Superfund site? Uh, the involvement of the community and how they were reacting and, and doing that kind of thing, I really don't know anything about that. Um, it was more from the standpoint of the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality that we were getting the feedback and, and understanding what was going on through them, mainly because we were looking to do bid work at that time on 
um, the assessment of the sites. And did you end up getting the bid? No. Um, it went to EA at that time, um, a Beltway Bandit, as we call them. They were an 8A with 700 employees at that time. Uh, they were the ones selected by the EPA to go in and do the, all the initial work. And was there any interesting information that you learned while you were putting together your bid or just getting the information and straightening out uh, to potentially work in the area? Was there anything interesting that you learned? <clears throat> well, at that time, um, going to bid on this thing, we were kind of surprised that we didn't get selected because we had, I had been involved, I was the main project manager for the teardown of the Morency smelter uh, for Phelps Dodge, the Clifton smelter, and also the New Cornelia or the Ajo smelter, uh, which we spent from 90, started on that in 93 and ended it in 97, uh, tearing down all three of the smelters, stabilizing all the impacts. We knew how to, to approach everything. And um, we did not get the bid work to go in on this project up here. And what signs or clues did you see as a scientist that alluded or suggested that there was a contamination issue? Mainly working on the three smelter sites here in Arizona beforehand, the teardowns that we did, we understood quite well what the potential impacts could be. Um, but we also understood that most smelters you take the height of the stack of the smelter multiplied by five, that's usually the maximum uh, impact surrounding a smelter site. And the Dewey Humboldt smelter, when they got through with their process, it came out to be three times instead of five times. And it's only 194 feet, so it didn't extend out very far, less than a thousand feet all the way around. And then mine sites, it's usually wherever the waste material gets moved to through storm activity uh, more than anything else than the actual mine itself impact anything outside of it. So uh, you have a very interesting background because you started it seems a lot of not just consulting here in the area but you had a lot of experience consulting in other locations uh, in Arizona and probably in California and then how did you get started in business of environmental consulting? And when I graduated from San Diego State in 76, yeah, 76, um, <clears throat> I went into the mining industry. And up until 1981, I, up until 1980, um, for four years, I was a exploration geologist for a small mining company in Nevada but we did an awful lot of projects uh, here in Arizona. Um, I actually looked at the Iron King mine at one point, you know, about, 90, 70, about 1979, I believe it was. Uh, we were looking at a joint venture with a uh, Canadian company to reprocess the tailings there. Iron Knight was there at the time. Um, in 1980 and 81, that's when the Hunt brothers were doing their thing with the silver and gold was going out of, out of sight. And everything fell apart in 81. Almost everybody in the mining industry went unemployed at that time. I went back to school, got my master's, uh, joined a firm, uh, Converse Consultants at that time. And the first project I was put on was for the Ironite mine to look at pot storm ponds and um, water protection and stuff like that for what they were doing, making Ironite out of the tailings. So in 1980, I was involved with the Iron King mine very early on. Uh, we knew about the lead, the arsenic, and everything at that moment, but there was no real environmental standards for anything, and it really didn't become a potential threat until 1986, um, when the first environmental laws were very first really coming to a head, um, being put out with the EPA and stuff. And also that changed that basically what got rid of ironite from the, the mine area was the new regulations, the understanding of impacts uh, from the, what their product was to the potential going out into the public because ironite was used in gardens. So people were getting exposed and more importantly than anything else, the ironite as a fertilizer uptake into plants, people were growing vegetables, they were eating the vegetables, growing the kids. 
So they had arsenic and lead from the food that they were doing from, from the iron. And that's what started that whole fertilizer aspect and, and looking at heavy metals and, and changing the whole industry around. Do you, can you tell me a little bit more about what you learned about iron IT? How how did you I don't know I guess I'm, I'm a lot of people don't know that that's where ironite comes from. Well, that's where it started. Uh -huh. uh, after the impact of all the heavy metals and stuff like that, ironite actually changed to a instead of mining a raw material, taking everything that they were mining, used that to develop a fertilizer. Uh, now it's now called ironite. It has the same properties, but there's no heavy metals into it. So they shifted majorly over, but at the time they were simply taking the raw mine tailings and just simply bagging them and shipping them off. That's all they were doing. But ironite, because it had a fairly good acidity to it uh, and it had the right components as far as sulfur content, um, calcium and other components that are really good for fertilizer, uh, that's where it went to. So I mean, it was a beautiful beautiful material that really uh, actually aided growth quite heavily. And ironate, when, before they got shut down, um, was producing a hell of a lot of material and they were actually looking to go into major industry as far as supplying things for row crops, um, um, corn, cotton, and that kind of thing. That's what they were looking to do. But with the heavy metals, they shifted the whole thing to a manufacturing process instead of just simply digging it up sizing it, bagging it, and, and shipping it. So they had to make a major change. And uh, so that's, I, yeah, I always find that very interesting because as a child, I remember ironite. Mm -hmm. uh, and my parents, I think, used it in their gardens. And I think it was a widely used fertilizer. Extremely widely used because it was a very, very good material. It had all the right components to grow. It just happened to have a, a heavy metal component to it that was uptake into plants. And what other Superfund sites have you worked on besides Iron King? Um, in Los Angeles, that was the Segun, uh, Chevron El Segundo refinery. That was a Superfund site. There was the GATX uh, Carson City Superfund site. Uh, then the Port of Los Angeles Superfund site. Um, those are the three big ones there in the state of Arizona, 19th Avenue, super fun site in downtown um, Phoenix. And then we worked with the EPA and with Phelps Dodge where we got delisted the smelter at Douglas, the smelter in Ajo, the smelter in Cl Clifton, and the smelter in Morency. Since they took an active form of cleaning the thing up, it never went to a super fun status. And so are, the, are those the only mines that you worked in in Arizona? No, those are the only cleanups I did. Um, that's a good question. I'd have to go look at it. Since I've been my own consultant, I know that I've done over or been at probably close to 200 different mine sites doing all sorts of different things. <clears throat> Claim evaluation, mineral evaluation, um, looking at what would be what would it take to actually get a mine into going on looking at reserve calculations um, investment um, things and the biggest thing i've been doing for the last five years more than anything else is is helping people try not to make bad investments uh, in mining uh, there's an awful lot of people that think that they can simply go out and buy a mining claim and find all this gold and do whatever they want. Well, that's not the case. There's a whole process that you have to go through. And that's what I help people doing is, is the permit process. And then what other early, before you uh, were uh, involved in the tag, what other activities did you do at the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter <clears throat> Well, Ironite was the very first time I played with doing anything in that particular area. Um, then with Converse Consultant coming back in, doing geotechnical work on design uh, for new ponds and expansion of the tailings area for what Ironite was doing. Basically, the leftovers from what they were working at, they needed a new area uh, for disposal of or containment of their, their material. 
Also, they were looking at um, wastewater at that time. Um, they had ponds where water was being pumped into. They wanted to know how it affected the ground, so they did the initial work there. Then later, uh, when the EPA came in for the first time with their main consultant, EA, um, I was retained by the Arizona Mining Association to review the draft report by EA, um, which I did a substantial review on um, for the Arizona Mining Association on what the work was done by EA. And then I didn't get involved again until uh, uh, three years ago. I think it was three years ago now, 2005 or 2015, where Rose was looking for another consultant. Um, her husband does computer work. He was doing work for me, found out I was doing things. And she came in, interviewed me, and I worked as the technical assistant um, for the TAG group for the, the city of uh, Dewey Humboldt. So that's perfect, because I wanted to find out how you became active with the smelter, with the Superfund site, and then and or the TAG grant. So it was just so happens that her husband was doing work, and that's how he learned about what you did, and she was looking for a consultant at that time. That is correct. Okay. And then um, when did you begin your work as a the consultant for the TAG grant? Um, almost immediately. Um, attended two or three different little meetings on behalf of the, the TAG. Uh, my whole thing was to take a look at the technical information that was being presented, trying to explain it to the community uh, in different little areas or presentations to, to the community as trying to put it into uh, less technical terms and more understandable uh, for the community. Uh, there were four or five of those things um, before the EPA went into this last assessment that they published in 2016. Um, and then I spent over 100 hours going through the three volumes of work and I have substantial commentary on, on the work that they did, but the EPA wasn't accepting anything. Um, the report was final. There was no draft, there was no comments, no adjustments to be made. And so then were you working as a consultant for the Commute Coalition of Dewey Humboldt uh, or were you? Simply to the tag. That was purely it. Okay. Uh, I made presentations to three or four other groups uh, within the city and to the city itself. Um, but realistically, I didn't find much emphasis from the city to move ahead. They were looking at the EPA to be able to come in and take care of everything. Um, a lot of the public or residents of the immediately impacted area thought that the EPA would actually pay for or take care of their particular problem, uh, which they basically haven't done. And what initial information were you researching or were you more most interested in when you started kind of putting it, like reading all the information in kind of the grant, the tag grant area? Um, due to my previous work at other smelters, I knew what to expect, what areas would be more problematic than anything else. So that's what I went into initially was to take a look back at that whole thing. Uh, one of the very first things I found in the work uh, from the EPA was their historical work that was done by a contractor out of Phoenix, um, completely missed the smelter aspects. Uh, there are four actual smelters there. They completely missed where three of the previous smelters were located. Um, the report that was put in 2016 by the EPA basically ignored where the three other smelters were. They came back, oh, we don't know where this stuff was or what it would belong to. Even though I had presented that information to them, they completely ignored it because it wasn't done through their contractors. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of those three smelters? <clears throat> the smelter plateau where the smelter is actually located uh, the very first smelter was the Agua Fria smelter. Um, it's actually located to the extreme southeast corner of the smelter plateau right off the uh, Agua Fria River. It operated in the 1870s. 
Um, and it actually had two different little smelters there. The picture that everybody shows is this big water wheel going around. Said, well, that's the smelter. That wasn't the smelter. The water wheel there was for the crushing. That's what it did. It crushed and it refined the materials in that particular building. We don't have a picture showing the actual two smelters that were there. I have the patent documents that shows that there were two beehive uh, furnaces and then there was one stack furnace. Well, there was one beehive uh, furnace there to make charcoal for the furnaces. Then there was a lead smelter, which was a beehive arrangement. And they could do about one ton a day in their particular smelting operation for that one ton of lead ore to produce for lead. Then the stack smelter was for smelting copper. We don't know how high that stack was, but I believe it was a good 40 to 50 feet high. You have to have enough heat to get that. You have to have the stack. There's all sorts of different little things going to it. But the Agua Fria smelter was the very first one in the area <clears throat> as far as real true smelting in the area. They smelted copper and they smelted lead. The big thing going on in the 1870s was the silver that was being taken out of the district. Uh, mainly the Agua Frio, the Walter, and the Kit Carson mine, which is about two and a half miles further to the west of where these things were located, that ore came down. And they were processing stuff that was running two and three thousand ounces per ton silver. And then it was at, um, running about a thousand pounds per ton uh, lead. So it was quite a bit real rich ore. The copper really wasn't worked too well at the time unless it had a gold content. That was the main thing of that first smelter. So we have the Agua Fria smelter. Then the next one was the Valverde smelter. The Valverde smelter was located about half a mile to the north, again, just off the edge of the smelter plateau area, right along the Humboldt River or the Agua Fria River. Um, it operated basically in the late 1890s through the early 1900s. Um, it burnt down <clears throat> due to flooding um, into the main smelter area. Um, the story goes from the one report from the LA Times at the time that slag hit the floor, exploded, and the building burnt down. Basically, the whole smelter at the time was, was gone. The thing that is kind of surprising, though, and it goes back to some of your, your other questions, there's no reports of any injuries or deaths. It just simply said that the thing burnt down. The majority of the workers at that time would have been Hispanic um, in that particular on the, on the floor. And that was a common thing at that time. If it was a Hispanic being killed, it just wasn't reported. Uh, I was very surprised not to see any kind of injury list in any of the newspapers at, at that particular time. After it burnt down, Another one was built uh, very close to it, which was the Arizona Smelter, or Arizona Smelting Company. Um, and it processed the same kind of materials. Now, Valverde and all the newer ones, so to speak, after that only processed copper. They did not process any lead. So there's a big change from what the Agua Free was doing to what they were doing up here. It was mainly for processing copper. Um, now the Valverde and the Arizona smelting was actually started by Fred Murphy and he's the guy that built the railroads down in this particular area. And the reason he built the smelters was, to, was so that he could process the ore from his own copper mines in the area. And that was mainly the DeSoto mine and the Bluebell mine. But they also did a lot of custom work. The Iron King mine was not in operation at that time. So the, those two smelters had absolutely no ore coming from the Iron King mine. It wasn't producing at that particular moment. Um, when Fred Murphy sold a good portion of the stock in his company, um, the new owners came in. They operated the thing at a loss. It went into bankruptcy. Um, Covassier. Um, there was an engineer out here at the time, Covassier, who later became the second state mine inspector and the first state geologist. So he actually has a history. 
um, in with that mine. He's the one that changed it from the Arizona Smelting Company facility. He basically tore it down and built the current uh, smelter facility, and which operated all the way through the 19, uh, early 1910s through World War I. Uh, after World War I, everything was in a depression. Uh, it more or less remained idle up until the 1940s um, after that. But there's four different smelters that were done out and through that area. The Agua Frio smelter has never been investigated by the EPA. The Valverde smelter, they have a couple samples and they say, oh yeah, they're hot, we don't know what it's from. The uh, Arizona smelter, same situation. Almost all the work has been solely on the current footprint of the smelter that operated uh, after the, essentially in, in the late 1910s. What were some of the impacts of the Community Coalition of Dewey Humboldt for if not the U.S. EPA tag grant? Basically, the tag, how it was operated here, mainly through how the EPA structured it uh, with Rose. <clears throat> Rose was to take, or the tag was to take mainly the comments from the um, citizens. She was to do initial response or send them on to the EPA who would respond back to her. Then she would communicate again to the community. She was the main correspondence, so to speak, between the EPA and, and the community. That's how the tag was set up in this particular instance. Um, and I was to do nothing more than review and respond back to her on technical issues if people asked them. And so basically your role was more of a technical advisor. You reviewed the documents, provided your knowledge on it, and then... Correct. And why did you decide to work on the U.S. EPA tag grant? I knew the site, and I thought it'd be fun to sit down and take a look at what they were actually doing. <clears throat> also, I was extremely interested in how the EPA was actually going to try to uh, or attempt to do a cleanup, and I was very disappointed in what they're doing. So then what was your experience with the grant? Can you tell me a little bit more? Um, basically, I was responding whatever Rose needed uh, for me to work on, I did for her. I did a lot of different little things, I made presentations, uh, gave them to, every, to different things. But for the most part, the presentations I did to like the community group, which you are involved with, um, I did on my own. I didn't do it through the tag group. The other presentations I made to uh, like the, the mining districts and the, the other clubs and stuff out through here, I did it on my own time. I didn't th do it through the tag, but it was something that, that needed to be done. The EPA actually um, discouraged or wouldn't pay for, as the case may be, um, doing those kind of presentations. And something that I had never really seen before uh, on the other Superfund sites where they had a similar tag or citizens advisory, they would actually go out of their way on the other Superfund sites to have um, the community advisors, the TAs, to do presentations and stuff uh, on, on a paid basis. Um, but here there was absolutely no support by the EPA for doing anything like that. It was more um, like an email or a mail drop more than any other single thing. Who were involved besides yourself? And were you the only person? I was the only TA, and then Rose was the community response, and nobody else. What do you want others to know about the tag grant? Maybe something that might not be well known. The way the EPA structured it here was different, quite a bit different than the other ones that are done um, on other Superfund sites. <clears throat> Here, this is the only one I've ever seen that actually did not have hired or retained the services of an attorney to advise the community on what the EPA was doing, interpretation, were they doing it within the structure of the law, 
was, wasn't it? What are the resources that can be brought to bear on things? Uh, also, how the tag group should have or could have reacted or, or worked with um, political people. Uh, how to react or send messages to the state senators, to the state legislature, to get them involved in the process. Because realistically, the state of Arizona, other than ADQ, has absolutely no interface whatsoever into what's going on here. And that really amazes me. Um, it's really really poorly constructed. There isn't any interface, and I believe it was a deliberate effort on the part of the EPA to keep out political influences on this so they can just simply go ahead and do their program without interference. Now, what are you most proud of when it comes to your involvement with the Iron King Mine and Complex Smelter Superfund study? Basically getting out more information that's there. Um, it hasn't gone as far as I thought it would or could. There's been a lot of resistance from the city. Um, they just don't want to hear it. And the local historical groups just don't want to hear what is out there. I've had more response from the town of uh, Prescott Valley and, and Mayor than I have from Dewey Humboldt itself. The three biggest things that have come from the results of, of this report, and actually something I thought would happen anyway, that the mine itself and the smelter itself has had no impact upon the groundwater that's currently being utilized. The groundwaters that are being seen out here, I mean, there's wells with high arsenic concentrations and stuff. It's due to the natural geology out here. In fact, the mineral trends are very well known. You can plot the things up very easily, and you can see where the wells that have high arsenic concentrations are basically placed within those mineral trends. And that's something that's completely missing. Um, the people that own those wells or the other resources and stuff, they really don't care. They think it's the, the mine and, or the smelter, and that's, they're not going to change their mind. They don't care about the real science or the geology or anything else. So the first thing is the water. The second thing is <clears throat> there's an awful lot of naturally occurring arsenic and lead in the area. The area to the west of Highway 169, it's a lead silver trend uh, with a low arsenic trend on that side to the west and to the east it's a copper arsenic trend. That's the big thing for the people living to the east of Highway 169, which makes up probably two thirds of the town of Dewey Humboldt, um, an awful lot of the lights. I've been to at least a dozen or so properties where I can actually find outcrops of naturally occurring arsenic and or lead. And these people are building gardens and doing other things out there that they shouldn't, that they're actually activating the naturally occurring material and they're introducing it upon themselves. They don't want to know anything about that, nothing whatsoever. And that's, that's a major no-no as far as I'm concerned. And the, the third thing is for the areas that are impact, and I would say it is roughly one-third of the downtown portion, uh, more or less using Main Street as the guideline um, those homes that are built there, those properties, haven't been cleaned up. They have been <clears throat> stabilized. They have not been remediated. What the EPA has done is come in and remove the top foot of soil so there's no direct exposure to the people living there uh, or to the surrounding town. So they've mitigated the immediate threat of exposure, but they have not um, clean things up, those properties still have a major liability to them. If you dig down below the one foot on those particular properties, you have an immediate exposure. And that viewpoint or that fact has not been brought forward. And the people that live there and the town itself don't really care. 
They don't want that known because it will, it will bring down property values. And I guess the fourth thing too is the other effects economic to the area. Insurance, that's the biggest thing there. Um, all insurance companies rate different areas by all sorts of different criteria. Well, if you're living in an area that has known contamination, such as a Superfund site, well, the statistics are anyone living in those particular areas, the insurance companies will either grant or deny access to insurance for the area for that reason, or, you need, or the insurance rates will be higher. And that's exactly what's happened out here. Insurance rates for the people living within the Dewey Humboldt um, zip code have a higher insurance rate. You can go on to any of the sites, put in different zip codes for the same insurance policy, and you can see a tremendous difference in the cost of insurance for health insurance, for property insurance, and also car insurance. Um, if people think that, hey, if you live next to a super fun site, it must be a depressed area. There must be um, higher crime rates, crime ridden, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so the insurance rate is automatically higher. So there is a, an impact there. And the EPA report done in 2016 clearly shows that it's very limited, that there are 50 some odd properties that have actually been impacted, 40 of which have not really been cleaned up, and everything should be limited just to those properties. Everyone else is being penalized just to those limited areas. So that needs to be brought forward. And the town really doesn't want to hear about it. They don't even want to attack or uh, attempt to even do any kind of mitigation. That would be a benefit to the entire town. And when I met you, we talked a lot about uh, the history of the area. And uh, you're very interested and you're very, very knowledgeable about history of this, this area. And so is there any interesting history that you would like to talk about that pertains to the Superfund site or just um, the area? I don't know if it's, like I said, little, little known history, maybe something about the Mexican-American miners in the area or geology that you're knowledgeable. Um, like I said, I've been in and out of Arizona for over 40 years, uh, 50 years pretty much, but uh, the Bradshaw Mountains, and that's the best way to talk about things. The Bradshaw Mountains is a highly mineralized area up and through here. Um, over 3,000 different mines with a production history in the area. The Iron King Mine is just one small mine. Uh, the smelter is just one small mine through the area. And the area was basically cleared, and I'll say it that way, the United States Army came in and removed the Apache Indians. This was the Apache stronghold. They declared it Indian free in late 1870. Starting in 1871 was the first mine discoveries up in the area. Lynx Creek, Hacienda, uh, as far as placer gold going on. Then the southern part of the Bradshaw area was the uh, um, tip top mine was found there. And shortly after that was the Peck Mining District. In the Peck Mining District, that was a major silver find that was supposed to be comparable to what was going on in Carson City. Um, the ore that came out of there initially was running two to 5,000 ounces per ton of silver, which is phenomenal. Um, so the richness of the area is known. It hasn't been mined out. The economics changed several different times, which closed the mines in World War I under the uh, uh, Single Man Act and then the Manpower Act of uh, World War II basically closed down the majority of the mines up through here. The removal of the railway system in the 1940s, 50s, um, shut down the economics of mining almost completely. Uh, roads in and out, power coming in in the late 40s. Um, the mines themselves, the smelter actually had its own um, coal gasification plant and supplied power to the entire region out here. The mine also, or the, the smelter provided the first telephones for the area, something that little pe people really don't understand uh, what was going on. So there's a lot of history dealing with how the development stuff came about. Um, a lot of fraud went on. 
um, with the smelter, like I was saying before, Murphy came in. Uh, he had the railroads to his mines, mining the ore to process the stuff, making it and then shipping out the concentrates and stuff. Um, he sold out, then there was a fraud situation there where everything went bankrupt. Uh, it came back in, uh, was completely redone in the 1940s uh, for World War II, basically, and a lot of processing and stuff going on there. Um, the Iron King mine actually didn't get developed into the 1950s. Um, so there was really no interaction between the smelter and the Iron King mine itself. There's only record of one uh, test tonnage being shipped from the Iron King mine <clears throat> down to the smelter and was found to be inappropriate for the smelting activity. It had to be say, taken somewhere else. Um, but there's just tremendous history all the way through. In 1871, in a territorial governor's report, the area that's now Dewey Humboldt used to be called Indian Meadows. And the description was that the area was a swampy Indian field land. So we have a description then back in the 1870s. Um, <clears throat> so it was a small transition from when the Indians were eradicated or removed from the Bradshaw Mountains in the late or early 1870 uh, to the area being completely free and clear more or less by 1871 that we had farmers coming in, that we had the miners coming in in big quantities, uh, especially Pres Prescott being indicated as the territorial capital uh, made a huge difference in, in people coming in. Um, the other impact too to the area that most people aren't aware of, that 1871, well that's after the Civil War. Um, 1863 was during the Civil War when the county basically got established. It wasn't until after the Civil War that the Army was free enough to come in and get rid of the, um, the Indians up and through here. But we had a tremendous influx of Civil War veterans looking to get away from things. And the different mining camps that were up here, you actually had Confederate camps, you had Union camps, um, and there was a lot of animosity through the entire state that way. So you had individual mines by, by different factions, so to speak. Um, most of the heavy labor and stuff that was done in this immediate area was done by Hispanics, uh, Mexicans. The, um, can't remember the mining outfit that ran the uh, Iron King mine now. Um, Dunshattuck. The Dunshattuck people <clears throat> were actually were part of the big boom in Bisbee. Um, and they did an awful lot of work all the way up until the 1930s when Bisbee started downhill progression. They came up here, started the Iron King up, the Dunshattucks. And they imported an awful lot of uh, Hispanic and Mexican miners from Bisbee to mine their mines. It was their workforce. They brought them up. So, I mean, there was an import of, of labor up and through here. Um, the history in the smelter, like I said, when the Valverde mine uh, burned down due to the slag explosion, all newspaper accounts and stuff doesn't report anyone ever being injured. Yet, that was the common practice back then. If there was a Hispanic or a Mexican or a Chinaman that was killed, it wasn't news. So it was not reported. There had to have been people killed during that explosion. That was a tremendous event to have something like that happen. And people had to be present for the slag to be spilt onto the ground. So there's, there are a lot of incidents like that where there's just things that are gone. Um, in the 18, I think it was 1889 map of the area, it shows a couple of cemeteries that are related to a Mexican cemetery that is no longer to be found in the, the Humboldt area. Uh, the, t the Mexican town of Agua Fria at the intersection of Lynx Creek and uh, the Agua Fria River no longer exists. Caltrans um, has built its regional headquarters on top of the old site. And there's nothing that can be found left of the historic of the area. So we're talking about a Mexican cemetery that disappeared, a Mexican town that disappeared, and the Chinese, they're only Chinese I know of that were in the area uh, was in Camp Verde, was the wing fields. They actually have a small um, mall complex in Camp Verde 
and they run a trash service, the Wingfield Trash Service, which is doing pretty well. Um, so they're the only Chinese I know that are here. And then if you look back at the Spanish, we have Chino Valley, Chino meaning China. So we, I know that the Chinese were up in Chino Valley, but there are no Chinese left uh, up in Chino Valley that I'm aware of. And there's almost no history available um, anywhere. The Charlotte Hall up through here, there's no record whatsoever. Um, and Wingfield would be a really good family to get a hold of to find out what brought them here and all that stuff. I know they've been here for a long time. Um, most of the Chinese in northern Arizona and throughout the entire state and in California during the 1880s, 1890s, during the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, they were chased, killed, no reports of anything going on. So who knows what really went on during the, that particular period of time. So. so is there, what do you think is the most important thing or piece of information that a community member should be aware of if they, or that they might not know about this site? I think the biggest thing is, and I've asked repeatedly of the EPA, and I've brought it forward to the city, enough information exists to sit down and put together simple maps showing where the contamination actually exists, contour maps showing where everything is out through there. And once those maps are put together, everyone knows what is what, and the city strongly against it because it has economic impact. Uh, to potential development within the town. I mean, the majority part of Main Street lies within some of the hottest contamination that's out there. So it would actually impact the development, future development of any kind of industry within the town. Um, it's already impacting at least the honest homeowners out there uh, from selling their property. Their values have gone down. Um, and the, the whole thing that's going on now is they want to get rid of the EPA, get the site delisted so it no longer has the stigma of Superfund so their properties can rise, whether the thing is cleaned up or not. And then thinking back on your experience at the Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? The big thing with the smelter and the mine Yes, there is contamination there. It's old style mining, old style processing. The new stuff basically doesn't allow it. I mean, it's, um, none of the new mining even comes close to having any kind of potential environmental impact. But the old stuff has impact, but more importantly, the geology, the naturally occurring rock that's out there that poses more a direct threat from homes being built upon it than the mines and the smelter itself. There are more people being exposed, like I said, in the um, eastern part of Dewey Humboldt from houses being built up on it, uh, fertilizers being used, horses, septic tanks. They're mobilizing uh, the naturally occurring arsenics and leads uh, with those materials. Nobody realizes that and nobody wants to talk about that because it directly affects what people can do with the property that they own and what the potential um, financial things are in future. I mean, there's a home up here that's being advertised now for a million and a quarter dollars. Yeah, up in the, the Dewey part of the area. And there are three arsenic bearing structures that go right through the property where they have their garden. Um, the guy that has the garden actually tested the, his wine because they had a little mini winery and was shocked to find out how much arsenic was in the wine that he was producing off his little uh, one acre vineyard that he had. And it's all due to the natural occurring stuff. And then how would you like your memory of your experience remembered? <laughs> um, basically that I have information and I'm more than willing to tell anybody what it is and give them the fact sheets show the actual EPA documents uh, that demonstrate the things, um, plus the other books and other resources that are out there. And how do you think that the memory of 
the Superfund site and the contamination will be remembered? I think it's going to be swept under the rug. Um, due to the economic concerns for development will be overriding than anything else. There are ways to contain um, the contamination and stuff there to where it won't be hard, uh, hurting, hurting anybody. But basically it goes to putting a thick enough, ca thick enough cap over the top of the material that when things are built upon it, that utilities, people putting in gardens and stuff like that will have little or no impact. It can be engineered. It's going to be expensive, but it can be engineered. And then how did you mainly learn about the progress of the cleanup of the Superfund site? Um, mainly through the city notice because the EPA has not been keeping in contact whatsoever. I don't get any emails or updates from them anymore. Um, I was before, but not anymore. I actually get more information from U of A's uh, monthly or quarterly meetings uh, and notices and stuff like that on what's currently going on than anything else. So, so then what was or was not useful when you did have that information reported to you? Um, it gave me a clue to what the attempt was going to be. Uh, the EBA, EPA has been extremely reluctant about releasing any real information. In other words, they say, oh, we have done X, Y, and Z, but giving the details, um, I've repeatedly asked for the sites that they supposedly cleaned up. <clears throat> Let's see your individual sampling maps. Let's see the individual sampling results. Let's see the letters that are being sent out to the individual homeowners. <clears throat> How is that being done? And it's been completely refused. I've also asked the city to request that information so they have an archive of it. And again, it's been refused. And then have you ever attended any meetings uh, regarding health impacts or studies in the area? I have requested of uh, the two groups that have been conducting the blood work and the other background stuff, and no one has been willing to release any information. And I've been found that a real surprise. And do you know where those groups are located? Are they uh, like U of A. The metal, the metal tests uh, for the blood and urine that was done, that information was done. Supposedly it was transmitted to the EPA. EPA is controlling it. U of A will not release it without the EPA doing the thing. Then the other thing I was told by the, I can't remember her name, uh, the doctor that's in charge, that it's currently being utilized in a couple of PhD dissertations. And until the dissertations are done, that the information can't be released which is totally bogus. And then what was the useful format for you getting information about the study where you did get the information from either U of A or the US EPA? In the EPA, the only information that's ever been released in any form whatsoever was the three volume report from 2016. Um, and I literally have hundreds of comments where I found things to be inconsistent or suspect in the way that it was done. The bioavailability aspect on arsenic and lead, um, I did not like the way that it was done and they wouldn't address any of the issues I had with it, the way it was done. Um, to me, the entire report, the way it was put together was basically to find not how to clean things up and be totally perspective, but how to save money more than any other single thing. And what advice do you have for state and federal governments that oversee the cleanup? Um, there is no federal oversight other than the EPA. The Arizona Department of Environmental Quality has a two-person group, super fund, that's supposed to be doing review work on this stuff. And I have seen them take absolutely no action. I have heard of them doing no review work on anything. I've asked them, what have they done? And I have brought a number of incidents that I found to be very troubling. And we have heard absolutely nothing on their input to anything. Did 
the Superfund site change your thinking about sources of chemical exposure in your own household or your work in general? No, because I had better knowledge than what's being presented through the Superfund. And then, uh, can you tell me what has changed your thinking then about chemical exposures in your household or your community? The only thing that's really come forward um, from the EPA work on the Iron King mine was that they found several elements there uh, which they were trying to bring forth as being introduced to the mine for rat control or rodent control up and through there, mainly the thallium and the antimony. Um, it wasn't until I pointed out to them that less than a couple hundred feet away from the mine site there's naturally occurring outcrop, mineral outcrops with the thallium and with the, uh, the antimony that exists right there. So it's not an imported thing. It really wasn't brought in for rat control as they're assuming. It's just that someone brought the ore in and they were actually testing it on site. There's three separate bits of mining history um, on, the smel on the mine site itself because they did custom work. They brought in a lot of material the Dunshattics did, mainly through Rick's, Rex, Rick's um, from other sites, and they tested it there. Now, we know exactly where the testing went on, and those hot spots for the antimony and the hot spots for the thallium, it's from the testing that they were doing. This stuff is out here. Antimony and thallium are extremely toxic in the refined state. In the mineral state, they're not that bad. Um, it's no worse than any of the other naturally occurring minerals. It isn't until it's altered or refined that it becomes a problem. Arsenic is toxic. Anemone is far more toxic, and thallium is even more toxic than that. So it, there's a whole scale of toxicity. It's just the amount of material that's available in the different ore types out here. Is there anything that you would like to discuss that I might have missed? A story you would like to tell and have people remember of your environment, I mean your involvement, the site or community advocacy, but just a story that you haven't added to this part of your oral history? Um, nothing I can think of off town that we haven't already um, hit upon. The the way things are being presented to the town right now is that they've done a mitigation, although the EPA is calling it a remediation. The only thing they've done is remove the immediate threat of exposure through contact with soil and through dust. That's the only thing they've done. They've done no real cleanup out here. Removing the top of one foot of soil to when there's 10 or 15 feet of material in a lot of these places out there um, has no real benefit to the homeowner or the property owner. And it's a long-term event because one foot utility comes in, septic tanks. Septic tanks are set at eight to 10 feet below ground. Leach lines, uh, which come out and actually will mobilize the material. There's actually no thinking whatsoever, no guidelines given by the EPA on what those particular impacts could be, how they're gonna address things. And more than anything else, it's that the leach lines, the septic systems that are more mobilizing of the contaminants than there has been anything from the smelter and mine itself. It's the homeowners, uh, fertilizers uh, activating things. That's, that's more of a problem. And they need to be not controlled. They have to be managed in a completely different manner. There's no management whatsoever now. No guidelines being given out. And that's where people are going to have more long-term events than anything else. This is actually part of a uh, presentation I have put together for the EPA and the community, which I've given out probably a good dozen times to different groups. Uh, and this is a Google Earth vertical shot of the smelter plateau. Uh, what I'm showing right here is the smelter stack, which is the current stack that's out there, uh, where these smelters were located. Uh, the first smelter, is the Agua Fria smelter. Uh, what I have here on the right side is the actual patent document uh, for the smelter. It's a five acre area uh, where it shows the mill, it shows the flume where they actually diverted water out of the Agua Fria to run 
a water wheel that did the milling. It shows the two furnaces here. One was charcoal, the other one was lead. And then we have the copper smelter. Um, this is a picture of what the beehive uh, furnaces would have looked like. Then we have a picture directly from the EPA documentation showing the water wheel and the mill itself. Um, this is showed photograph is from 1878 according to the um, EPA. Um, it's completely misrepresented. This is the mill. This is not the smelters. The smelters themselves would have been off over here to the left. Up here is a Google shot showing the plot of the actual piece of patented land and in relationship to the actual patent document which is surveyed in. This shows where the mill was sat and this shows where the smelter sat. And this is an area that the EPA has done absolutely no sampling whatsoever. And this is shows where it is in relationship to the overall um, smelter plateau. It's right down here in the extreme southern part of the smelter. Then we have the Verde smelter location. Here's a better picture than what the EPA has. They have a very bleached out one. It shows the stack of uh, the, the Verde smelter here. Uh, you can see a discharge pipe coming down here, running down into the Agua Fria. Um, and then we have the hot smelter material, and you can actually see smoke coming off of where some of the slag was dumped on this particular uh, feature here. In the background, and very important, are these two low hills. Well, this is Spud Mountain, and this is Spud Junior. Taking Google Earth, rotating it down, Here's the remnants of the area where you can see the uh, slag heap here. You can see where the discharge point here coming down to the Agua Fria. And to show the relationship, there is Spud and Spud Jr. So there's the true relationship. In addition to that, there's a tramway here. That's what this trench is. And here's the trench here. And you can see where the foundations are left behind. Here's the vertical shot. Again, you can see the slag area. You can see the foundations of the smelter and the tramway. So here is physical proof of where the thing is located. EPA, again, completely uh, missed it. They took three samples out in this area and said, oh, gee, it's hot, but we don't know why it's there. Um, and then the big thing again, 1904, as reported in the Los Angeles Herald, uh, molten mass explosion, attended fire destroyed the plant with a loss of 175,000. Um, further reports said, stated that the smelter floor was flooded when the slag hit the floor, set the building on fire, and there were no reports of injuries. Well, the majority of the workers that were there supposedly were Hispanics or Mexicans, and there's no report of any injury or deaths. There had to be somebody to destroy the building like that. And this is where that smelter would have been located. Again, smelter plateau, there's the, the stack. After the fire, um, what was supposedly built on the old foundation, but here's the Arizona smelting uh, photograph. This is the one that comes directly out of the EPA report. Uh, you can see the hills in relationship. You can see where the stacks are. And by doing simple triangulation of the features here, it's easy enough to draw a line, but where exactly it is on the top, you needed a different view. Going back through, I found in the Arizona State Mine Inspector files a different shot showing Arizona uh, smelting, and you can see the peaks in through here, again doing simple triangulation coming down. It was easy to plot where this thing was located, and that's where it's located up and through here. Again, Agua Fria was down here, the Val Verde was here, and this is where Arizona smelting was. Basically, just moved over about 400 feet. Then we get down to the fourth one, the Consolidated Arizona Smelter. Uh, this is the one that was built um, by Covassier. You can see the stack here. This is the same stack that's currently remaining. You can see the facility. Here's the rail line that came in that Murphy put in uh, for his materials. This is the concentration plant. That's the actual smelter there. This is the one um, from that's in the EPA report. And when you put it all together, these are where the four smelters actually sat. The Agua Fria, the Valverde, Arizona smelting, and the Consolidated Arizona uh, smelter. 90% of the work has all been conducted here on the smelter. 
very little work has been done on these other three smelters in the immediate area. Um, then this is the map that was put together in the 2016 report. This is the Iron King mine. This is the uh, smelter down and through here. What you're seeing in all these little dots are this actual sample points. The green ones being no big deal. The reds and orange are something that was found at impact. Here we have the northeast corner of the smelter map. This is where the current stack is sitting right here. And you can actually see where the smelter emissions actually impacted the ground in through here. This is typical of what you would see coming off the stack. Something that was completely missed. It was, these are samples taken. Since they didn't know that the other smelter was sitting down here, the Val Verde and the Arizona smelting, you can see the exact same pattern showing up through here. There's nothing naturally occurring. Up through here, they're sampling. This is actually an outcrop up and through here where there's naturally occurring arsenic in this immediate area. So again, it's very easy to see where the smelter impacts are versus the naturally occurring. And that's basically all I have to, to show that on this particular instance.